Hello, my name is Dr. Joanna Kuyaba, and I would like to welcome you to the Other Goddess um, channel, where we discuss the archetypes of the Other Goddess, Mary Magdalene, sexuality and spirituality, higher magic, Kundalini energy, spiritual experience, and all the weird side of this. And today, I'm so happy to introduce Chance Gardner of the Magical Age Egypt to you. Hello, Chance. How are you? Very good, Joanne. How are you? I am very good because I'm really excited about today's interview. For those who don't know, and I don't think there are many people who don't know, um, Chance is the creator of a magical uh, Egypt series, which is now out for two decades, I would say, right? Is it two decades? And this is what every creator wants, you know, that your work is lasting and people are still interested. And this is what happened here. So uh, I would like to ask you, what inspired the series, the magical Egypt, you know, that everybody is watching? This is going to sound like a reverse engineered answer. It was a Kundalini event. Ah. <laughs> Kundalini experience is frequently reported to be a distinct feeling of electric current running along the spine. A wide range of physical or temperature sensations and often visions or other psychic phenomena. At the same time, significant shifts or openings in one's psyche are commonly reported. One's view or perceptions of reality and ego identity are altered as one becomes awakened. This often opens up new ways to energetically and emotionally connect with oneself, other beings, the universe, and divine, infinite consciousness. As we turn to this most mysterious, most taboo, and perhaps centrally significant subject, we're not only learning one of the deepest secrets of the ancient world, but perhaps for the first time in millennia, we are on the brink of rediscovering a central mystery about ourselves, a secret mechanism hidden at the very center of each of us, something that might be called the cosmic trigger, a trigger in the sense that once pulled, it triggers or catalyzes an electrochemical, physio-psychic reaction from which there is no return. It is sometimes said that hidden within this secret is the power to trigger radical shifts in the evolution of the human species and human consciousness. The investigation has brought to the fore the mysterious symbolism of the serpent as a signifier of the strange phenomena known as Kundalini. Before I got into television, I did video games, graphics for video games. Mm -hmm. And just randomly, I happened to choose as an art direction style, ancient Egypt, just because at the time it hadn't been overdone. And it was one of the few art direction styles that I could work in as an animator that seemed interesting, you know? So I started studying ancient Egypt because I didn't know much about it, except I was just vaguely interested in it. And among my research, I came across this book called Serpent in the Sky by John Anthony West. And it was the coolest, strangest, most interesting, just dripping with the occult and esotericism and really showed a side of Egypt that was so rock and roll and it was so forbidden and completely different than the missionary position things that we've learned about Egypt in school. <laughs> yeah. And so I was just, I was absolutely hooked and I began just, I began this genuine fascination. And at some point, um, randomly this second element entered the timeline that when I started noticing the symbolism in particular the snake coming out of the third eye of all the pharaohs it was such an iconic and central image yes most uh orthodox Egyptologists flatly deny that the Egyptians knew anything about kundalini and it was a strictly a Hindu or Vedic tradition I mean, if you understand kundalini symbolism from around the world they all have these clusters they all have include the snake in different forms, but they all include the snake, they all include the third eye, 
diencephalon. If you begin to study symbolism, you see that there's only been one story that is at the center of most religious structures, certainly the center of esotericism and the mysteries. It's at the center of yoga. It is yoga. It is essentially mm -hmm. the heart of yoga. And uh, it becomes impossible to deny that this tradition is present throughout our past. Um, by the way, all the way back to Gobekli Tepe. I don't, I don't know if you know much about Gobekli Tepe, but yes, yes. 13,000 year old tradition. There's statuary there and imagery and it's crude. It's not beautiful like Egypt, uh, Sumeria. It's weird. Or any of those. It's, but so weird. it's strange. And the symbol is a snake coming down over the top of a head and resting at the third eye. It's the same symbolism, very un-Egyptian looking, but yeah. all the way back in 13,000 BC, we see this obvious Kundalini symbolism. And so it led me to this realization that um, what might be the very most important human experience, this artelos, this thing that we're really here for, has been systematically weeded out of our culture, withdrawn. And so these two subjects synergized, and I began to really focus on Egypt as a early birthplace of Kundalini. I believe the Vedas and the Hindu culture pioneered it, but it was certainly of central importance to ancient Egypt, and it isn't acknowledged by Orthodox Egyptologists, but it is clearly the most important thing that there was in the ancient world, and why wouldn't that be the case now, which raises the question, why has it been withdrawn from modern society? That's right, that's right. And you know, we have some commonality here. So you actually uh, touched upon this because uh, I am writing about Kundalini experiences as well, although not so much in Egypt. I just touched upon, you know, the theories that Akhenaten and Nefertiti were using it as a sexual alchemy, I call, and also the earlier pharaoh, the female pharaoh Hatshepsut, who apparently was uh, doing something like that in the temple as well. well. So obviously it was at the core, you know, of Egyptian beliefs because the pharaoh were the carriers or bears, right, of the, of the beliefs. Yeah. yeah. Um, interestingly about Akhenaten, all of Akhenaten's imagery is androgynous. Have you ever, you've seen the statues of Akhenaten where he has female It's so hair. strange. He looks, that's why, you know, there are lots of like Asian alien theories about it, that, you know, he was maybe an alien because, you know, it's kind of protruded tummy, but kind of lanky, lanky yes. body parts, you know. But just for our viewers, I would like to maybe introduce some of them to uh, Anthony West or John Anthony West, who wrote The Serpent in the Sky, because I think he wrote it in 1993. And Graham Hancock, I think, wrote his Fingerprints of the Gods in 1995. So he's actually pre-Hancock, so to speak, right? So he, he, he really started this kind of alternative research into history. And if for a long time, I, because I'm an academic as well, I was struggling with this. Because, you know, I try to keep some discernment, but on the other hand, you know, something doesn't add up. And I think one of the things that you discussed in the other show that I heard, you know, Higher Side Chats, which was a fantastic show, thank you, it is that you were discussing something that now is up out in the open, at least in alternative circles, you know, the dating of Egyptian culture. The, the evidence of the, the extent and level of knowledge available to ancient civilizations is becoming more and more apparent. And the further it goes, the deeper we go, the, the more sophisticated it appears rather than the less so. Now, the question then arises, how did they get so smart? One of the keys to finding out if it is indeed findable outable is to try and stop looking at what they did through our eyes. They acquired information by some other method. John West was a remarkable man, uh, an incredible author. John was the author of the groundbreaking book, Serpent in the Sky, which is just an absolutely mind-blowing, revelatory thing that, that shows us a totally different take on the ancient Egyptian culture and the uh, anomalously sophisticated science and technology on display in the ruins. At some point in the mid 80s, John's book was optioned and became a television special. Uh, it was called Mystery of the Sphinx and it premiered on NBC. This was back when there was only four networks. And so the audience for his uh, Mystery of the Sphinx special was vast. I think it was something like 90 million people tuned in. But through John's early television appearances and through his books, he inspired a whole new generation of people like Graham Hancock and Robert Baval, people in the Magical Egypt series, who've all in their own way recognized something in what John brought to light and have done their best to pick up the torch and carry it a little further. 
create a more clear window into the bizarre and unexpected mental landscape of our most ancient ancestors. It is a sad fact of history that even the most bloodthirsty conquerors were intelligent enough to realize the danger enshrined in ideas. And so book burning has been the sport of conquerors from the very beginning, right up to and including um, Hitler, who went out of his way to burn all sorts of things. And even recently, the, when my friend Rupert Sheldrake's first book came out, um, the editor of Nature magazine suggested that this was a good candidate for book burning. So uh, the, and of course, uh, who but the scientists are the conquerors of today. John was probably most famous for bringing an observation to public awareness about the Great Sphinx. The Sphinx enclosure was weathered in this way that only decades of heavy rain would make. And since the Sphinx is in the Sahara Desert where it hasn't rained that much for centuries, the geological weathering and some other features make it look like the Sphinx and its enclosure have been there since before the last ice age when the Sahara was a fertile tropical zone. That assessment of John's, that dating of John's was highly contested by Orthodox Egyptology whose argument was there were no civilizations back then, so what you're saying can't be true. And beyond that, they wouldn't really look at his evidence. And then a couple of decades later, the discoveries from Gobekli Tepe came to light. And suddenly it was proven and accepted that civilization has been around since at least 13,000 BCE. So ultimately, John and his work was vindicated. And of course, he won in the court of public opinion, but Orthodox Egyptology is still sticking to its guns and denying the ages and the timeline that West has put forward. The ancients understood that the human body was the temple of the soul and was just as holy in its own way. And in certain instances, they actually reproduced the body or various parts of the body to represent cosmic functions. And so in Egypt, as Schwaller's magisterial scholarship demonstrates to us, the Temple of Luxor is built to exactly the proportions of the, of the male skeleton. And of course in Egypt, other portions of the body were also used to express particular cosmic functions. The face of Hathor, and this is now accepted even by Egyptologists, in fact it was an Egyptologist who discovered it, who was no longer remembered for having discovered it, A. A. Barb back in the 1950s, that the face of Hathor represents a uterus. And Hathor is, of course, the mother of all. Her name means the mother of Horus. So we find wherever we look, and I'm sure that the, um, that the, that the Hindus and in Vedic India also um, built according to the same, the same understanding and principles. In fact, when Shwala de Lubitsch published, or was ready to publish his, his grand work, The Temple of Man, Le Temple de Lum, he stopped, he downed tools for a bit, because at that time, a book, a massive study called The Hindu Temple by a, um, a scholar of Vedic and, and Hindu doctrine, Stella Kramrish, uh, produced her book, and Schwaller was amazed and delighted to find that the same geometric and, the same geometric and harmonic and numerical principles that were in place and commanded the structure of Luxor were also used by the Hindus and found expression yet again in the Gothic cathedrals specifically or perhaps most significantly in Chartres. So the knowledge was handed down. You can read from the, the fabric of John's text, the way he puts ideas together, the way he supports all his claims. John thinks like a scientist and he was forged in this fire of contention where because he took a stance that was so unpopular among academia, you know how academia will pick your bones clean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, John was, to, what, what John West was to me, there was a character in the um, early 1900s called Schwaller de Lubitz, who was an amazing, he was friends with Henri Matisse. Schwaller de Lubitz was the head of the, the Theosophical Society for a while, kind of Schwaller was a chemist. He was a mathematician. He was a, uh, what's that called? What is that when you have a number of different core? Polymath? Polymath. He was yeah. a polymath. And so because he understood so many different disciplines, he was able to recognize something in Egypt. Most Egyptologists are not mathematicians. Most Egyptologists are not chemists. Absolutely, most Egyptologists are not steeped in esotericism and the mysteries of 
And so there was some really iconic Masonic symbolism, very pronounced occult symbolism that is on display in Egypt that was either intentionally ignored and suppressed or um, was just never recognized. But Schwaller de Lubix was the first one to recognize all of these Masonic symbols. And more importantly, the presence of like the Fibonacci progressions and all of these natural geometric uh, organic bits of geometry that were used to govern the temple, the same geometry that governs life, you know, the yeah. Fibonacci spiral in the snail and the Fibonacci spiral in our ear and in hurricanes and in the branching of flowers. Plants and trees and yeah. yeah. So they call that a mathematical archetype. And he had this revolutionary insight that what we translate as the Egyptians worshiping gods, the Egyptians actually, their name for it was the netters, which really means principles. And so when you think of, instead of worshiping gods, they were worshiping principles, principles of physics, principles of nature. Wow. You have to ask, well, is that a religion or is that a science? Have we insulted them by saying they were religious and superstitious when in fact they were practicing really sophisticated science and just using this very right brain symbolic allegorical method of relating these things? And so the Egyptians not only seem to have known these really complicated physical, mathematical, geometrical, but also biometric things about us. And the core mystery that seems to be suppressed intentionally or unintentionally overlooked is this transformative self-initiated catalyst that we can all, that we all have access to. Robert Anton Wilson called it the cosmic trigger. We all have this cosmic trigger in the very center of us, the pineal gland, the diencephalon complex. The most important secret of humanity was on display in Egypt. And a few interesting characters throughout time really noticed it and leaned into it, which compelled me to understand, first of all, why was it suppressed? But secondly, if this is so important, why aren't we all pursuing this thing that's absolutely within the grasp of every one of us? So would you say that uh, ancient Egyptians were actually scientists of the consciousness, of our consciousness, and they had methodology, which was perhaps a spiritual methodology, you know, that a body as a form of technology. And if we access to actually the higher wisdom of our body and we access what in Hinduism is called uh, uh, Kundalini energy, but, you know, the energy that drives everything really in the entire cosmos, right? Then we actually we are the gods because for example in in, in my book i mentioned that in um, esoteric tantra you know it says that you'll be walking like gods and goddesses on earth once you access this energy so i think that maybe you suggest that gods and goddesses of egypt were people who access this kind of energy and this energy all the great beings including jesus and everybody else are telling us don't worship me you know it's really a tragedy of every religion actually i don't know who is actually ruining it for everybody but be like me you know this is available for you right they actually bring technology spiritual technology or technology of consciousness for us but somehow we feel or somebody wants us to feel that we are this slave species and we start to worship the people who actually wanted us right, to be liberated right i couldn't say it better than you've just done it absolutely correct and especially i want to land on that point that you'd said about they were scientists they were scientists they had a very beautiful well what what makes it important to me was not only were they consummate scientists and scientists the focus of whose science is on the mysteries of consciousness and the allegory between the universal invisible things that run the universe and the structure of the psyche. So even to this day, Freud tried, Jung tried, we don't really have an accurate model of mm. the psyche. This is what that allegory of the blind man and the elephant, you know, the man by yeah, the trunk yeah. sits the elephant yeah. and the snake, the man by the leg sits the elephant is a tree. And so that is consciousness. It's our relationship to trying to describe consciousness. So what you'd said is brilliant. And it's the thing that I've been working towards um, as I create these shows is we have misunderstood our past uh, ancient Egypt and ourselves because we keep trying to take this ancient science and make it appear to be a religion or a superstitious bunch of things that you do because you're afraid of death. The one thing we still can't explain is the most fundamental thing there. Oh, where do our thoughts come from? Why am I me and not you? Why am I aware of myself? The Egyptians' entire focus of their science was about explaining and schematizing consciousness 
the research we've done in Magical Egypt shows that they absolutely understood the biometric, the biological components that allow us to participate in consciousness. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that it was done in such an intelligent and sophisticated way raises the question, who's more scientifically advanced? That's right. And I'm returning to my original question, then how would you date uh, Egyptian culture? Because obviously, how, either, where did they get it from? You know, that's why there are all of these Asian aliens and Atlantis and so on. So I wonder about your opinion about Atlantis and how uh, you think reliable it is. And also, uh, if they arrived at, uh, at this by themselves, then obviously the culture must have been much more ancient because, <laughs> because uh, you know, <laughs> how did they get some <laughs> such sophisticated methodology for consciousness and spirit, right? And using body to actually reach this higher level of consciousness. Yeah. Obviously, there were earlier chapters of human civilization. It mm -hmm. may be profoundly, vastly old. There's a gentleman named Michael Cremo, who's a friend of John West, and an amazing, amazing you know, series of books called Forbidden Archaeology. Mm -hmm. There are things that they've dug up in strata that are um, completely datable to millions of years ago that have wheels and hammers and sculptures. There was clearly at least one, perhaps thousands, millions of previous chapters. Maybe we've always been here. That's one of those strange things about time. That, mm -hmm. And so for the same reasons that Kundalini and uh, Tantric ideas have been suppressed. The idea of previous chapters of human civilization has been incredibly suppressed. This is where Graham Hancock really got a lot of mileage that he's picked that up and run with the idea that he has a great line, we're a species with amnesia. You said that, you know, uh, 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 human culture, so to speak, uh, human history is much older than we are allowed to think. And I, um, I tend to agree with you. But about Egypt itself, do you agree with this uh, thesis that perhaps it was an Atlantean culture or uh, or alien culture? You know, I just want to cover your opinion on, on this, because people who are going to watch this video, they are going to have this in mind. Plato's story of Atlantis is generally understood to be an allegory, but as far as I can tell, it was sort of a catch-all name for a kingdom and, and an era in human civilization. It was a global civilization, so it's not so clear-cut to think of it as a space or a place. But in my mind, at least an era or a stage in the rise and fall of human civilizations, Atlantis was a civilization who advanced to a place where, according to legend, uh, technology got away from them or one that just had the misfortune of being there to witness one of the great geological cataclysms that seemed to happen with some regularity throughout time. According to legend, the, the scattered survivors migrated to other places and brought with them the ancient, weirdly sophisticated sciences and arts. Atlantis is a helpful word to use to indicate some earlier ancestor culture. The, the memory of this previous, largely forgotten era or civilization was kept alive through myths and legends and through their adaptation and, and evolution in places like Egypt, Samaria, Babylonia, the Near and Far East. So according to Plato and other ancient historians, the previous chapter of human civilization lasted tens of thousands of years before they were brought down by some geocataclysm. So if you think of how much we've invented and accomplished in just the past 150 years or so, from horse and buggy and steam trains to personal computers and holograms at CERN. We've already had enough time for four industrial revolutions, apparently. Imagine how advanced we'll be in 4,000 years. So the technology, the engineering, the anomalous science, and the seemingly inexplicable understanding of the mysteries of consciousness and universe, and their confidence about the nature of the afterlife, to the point of creating very explicit maps of what to do in the afterlife, all of these things can be just as easily understood as a very advanced science, very much in line with what Arthur C. Clarke famously said about advanced civilizations. The quote was something like, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I think this is part of the reason for the confusion about what was going on in ancient Egypt. So human intelligence and creative genius being what it is, you really don't need to resort to alien uplift or intervention to explain how mankind has achieved such bewildering sophistication in our science and our understanding of consciousness. Imagine what humans can accomplish over a span of thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of years of uninterrupted progress and human and technological evolution. John West's tour through Egypt was a tour where the old world was peeking out, so peeking out of the ruins. 
the, the Egyptian ruins are incredibly old, but the Egyptian ruins were built on top of something, like Pompeii was like this. Um, frequently around the world, if you dig down below ancient ruins, you'll find even older ancient ruins down below, especially around the Sphinx, the Valley Temple. There's a place called the Osirion, where the architecture is so old, it's pre-Egyptian, and it's pre-Egyptian by possibly hundreds of thousands of years. The wow. Great Pyramid very well be hundreds of thousands of years old. There are ruins in Egypt, the Valley Temple and the Osirion, that are like Stonehenge. They're massive and megalithic. They have no um, hieroglyphs on them. Uh, hundreds of indicators that these were not of Egyptian origin. And of course, they're incredibly old, way older. So a lot of the oldest first dynastic uh, ruins in Egypt were built on top of vastly much older ruins that no one wants to address because nobody can say anything about them. So uh, Plato, who was, you know, very obviously one of the most intelligent humans that ever lived, but also he was the historian of record for the ancient world. The farthest back that we can look, there are records of people in ancient civilizations, like Plato and Herodotus and so on, who talk about their ancient history. As far back as ancient Greece is for us, uh, ancient Egypt stretched back, but Egypt and the Greeks and uh, all over Asia and the Vedantic, you know, uh, Hinduism, they're quite open. There's no secret that there were civilizations dating back hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. This is an example of actual provable science, that there has been civilizations here for an incredibly long time. And that to me is not the mystery. The mystery to me is why people in power would be so interested in keeping us from knowing that and uh, suppressing that information and generally abusing and bullying anybody who tries to draw attention to it. That's true, but that's why, you know, we have shows like yours, you know, that, you know, open people's minds to, and eyes actually, both actually, you know, to, 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 to the alternative interpretation of our human history. But I just would like to repeat, come back to this question. So do you think that it was Egyptian civilization, human civilization, and this, this, the idea of Atlantis, is it uh, uh, basically a uh, compiled failed civilizations or, or was it actual civilization? What do you think? It's a very interesting question because one answer is very material. Like I was super excited about aliens when I was younger and I was in my yeah. teens. And John West, and I, I've met so many amazing people through Magical Egypt and the, the most beautiful idea I've ever heard. If you introduce the ideas of aliens, you've still maintained materialism. It's still okay. a material, mechanical explanation. The idea that I tend to like better is that humans have access to a higher consciousness. Either it's intuition, it's the collective consciousness. An idea that I hope we'll discuss is Kundalini itself is consciousness. Our consciousness is so expansive and it's so big and that we can overlap with other consciousnesses that may not be physical, they may not be physically in our register. It may be the intelligent fabric of the universe. I'm quite interested in this. And this really is kind of the backbone of modern magical practice. Reality itself is an intelligent fabric that you can imprint your will on or that you can communicate with. And so anybody who's had a Kundalini experience, you have a visit from the other. And it's this other with a massive and foreign, I almost said alien, but foreign intellect. It's not you, it is the voice of the other. And it is so intelligent and so strange. And so anyway, the point of this is, I prefer to think, and from the research I've done, there are states of consciousness that we can achieve that allow us a deeper um, degree of consciousness where intuition and just basic knowledge uh, very nicely covered by the Hindu idea of the Akashic records or this state of all knowing. Um, aliens diminishes us. Aliens keeps us in this state where we're helpless cavemen bumbling along. Seems like the reason, possibly the reason that this is suppressed is there's something about ourselves that we don't know. There's yeah. something about ourselves and a type of uh, consciousness that if we could connect to it, we would be unrulable, we'd be ungovernable, we'd be unfoolable. There are these modes historically of accessing higher consciousness, vastly greater intelligence. And for some reason in modern society, possibly because of the evils of rulership or the demands of commercialism, we've been bred to believe that we are nothing but material beings and we don't have access to this magical power. 
I agree with you. But, you know, returning to what I was just saying, because um, I agree what you're saying about aliens. I'm not interested that much in spaceships, but most recent kind of dialogue about aliens is actually exactly what you said, as the other, which it started really with Jacques Vallée and then Diana Pasuka and Jeff Kripal, who talk about UFO encounters as spiritual encounters. It's a really different form of spirituality and also most more likely interdimensional connection, you know, but something because there could be a UFO event and some people see it, the other people don't see it. You know, how is it possible? It's, it has to be related to the state of our consciousness, right? And other people's consciousness. And just uh, when you talk about materialistic de determinism, I agree with this because I come from a tradition which I adopted through Tantra of Kashmir Shaivism, which basically says, Everything is consciousness. The consciousness created body, you know, every, so the whole thing, the whole big bang or the whole eternal universe actually started with consciousness. And the rest is just a play of consciousness on, on whatever, right? Including our bodies, including physicality. So we actually start with consciousness. So I think that you suggest that Egyptians actually knew this technology. Right. And whether they invented it or they inherited from other civilizations is kind of irrelevant. And this was what do you believe, believe that this is what was actually Egyptian magic? Because lots of people are interested in Egyptian magic. Do you think that Kundalini energy or basically playing with consciousness and then some people argue, in, including Graham Hancock, that they actually build the pyramids through the movement of consciousness rather than you know, any mechanical ways? So would you think that this is actually the, the, the Egyptian magic, you know, the, the control, the ability to uh, harness consciousness? So Schroeder de Lubix used to say this in kind of very enigmatic way that vision had to exist before the eye existed. It's because of sound that the ear exists. And he it takes a while to describe this, but basically everything devolves from consciousness. That's why we see the same geometric archetypes. That's why music works. Mm -hmm. um, there's hidden train tracks that only exist in consciousness that everything in the material world falls in line with. And there's no real reason for that to be if it was a material world and consciousness was accidental. Every node of consciousness is a component in this larger universal consciousness, the thing that existed before anything, before matter came into being. I suspect that the Big Bang isn't quite correct and that yes. the way that we don't understand because we don't really understand what time is, there was never a time when there was nothing. Maybe there it's isn't good. time. Maybe there isn't time. I think one good thing about the pandemic was that I realized that time doesn't exist. And it kind of continues post-pandemic. Like oh. uh, everything was so regimented according to time in my universe and everybody's else. And now whether I talk to myself or anyone else, everybody says it's just like fluid. Everybody realizes that time is kind of not really real. It's some kind of super imposition i guess on the matrix to for us to believe that time exists and ex and experiences like kundalini experience also which i had it, it was exactly like that because it is when i was explaining this it is why is a part of you that you feel waking up in you but it's also not you i had a strange feel like this thing was so big and wiser than me you know and it just it was absolutely intelligent so it wasn't something you know some trick and uh, and it, 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 it actually, I could feel it thinking within me. Uh, it was thinking thoughts that you wouldn't have had. It was intelligent and telling you things you didn't already know. Like it's easy for a psychologist to say, oh, you're digging deep or you're, you know, something you're telling back to yourself. They say it's the left hemisphere talking to the right hemisphere. But you can only tell yourself things that you know. You know, if you're in a dream mm -hmm. and you see a book that you've never read and you open the book in your dream, there won't be words in the book. You can only regurgitate what you know in a hypnagogic state or in a, you know, whatever. And so the intelligence and the strangeness, and also it seems to speak to you with a personality that is beyond time. In Hinduism, the concept of Kundalini, a Sanskrit word meaning either coiled up or coiling like a snake, refers to the mothering intelligence behind yogic awakening and spiritual maturation. Leading to altered states of consciousness. 
In Hinduism, Kundalini is a form of divine feminine energy or Shakti, believed to be located at the base of the spine in the Muladhara. It is an important concept in Shaiva Tantra, where it is believed to be a force of power associated with the divine feminine or the formless aspect of the goddess. This energy in the body, when cultivated and awakened through tantric practice, is believed to lead to spiritual liberation. That's very interesting what you said about the uh, left and right hemisphere, because I read a long time ago that once they recovered Einstein's brain, his both hemispheres were connected. So they don't know if it happened because he was such a genius or whether he was genius because they were not connected, they were connected in him. And, you know, so there's a physical evidence for this. So in um, LSD. And in Kundalini, you know, Kundalini, the energy comes up and the reason it's always portrayed and coming up through the brain, just for a moment, the two separate hemispheres fuse in the Kundalini, mm -hmm. uh, which may be the reason why we have that Akashic um, yeah. Uh, epiphany. Yeah. Uh, in the LSD studies, they were doing brain scans of uh, people on LSD. And up until the critical event horizon, where you really start to trip, the brain hemispheres were doing what they do and they do their separate complementary, you know, working together like Republicans and Democrats and, you know, down the aisle. <laughs> and of, um, when LSD takes over, suddenly the brain syncs up. Like, you know, Robert Monroe back in the 70s was all about hemisync, hemisphere yeah. hem sync synchronization. And so the super genius, these either artists experience it with these transcendent works or Rene Descartes or uh, Einstein or... Um, Who's a good one? Isaac Newton, who's a consummate alchemist. They'd had these moments of non-standard consciousness. There's something about a type of consciousness that we can access, access that is a collaboration or a unification of the two hemispheres, mm. which allows access to different types of thought and maybe a more direct one-to-one -one communion with this disembodied intelligence of the universe or of kundalini thank you for your touched upon this because i really liked what you said on the higher side chats that you said that Rome, that egypt was not conquerable until the roman empire actually stole the magic so tell me what magic they stole and tell me the story all right so stephen skinner you okay with dead screen for one minute one second Okay, you techniques of greco Egyptian magic. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this. I'll definitely take a note. Um, Stephen Skinner is this brilliant, brilliant man, very fun person to hang out with. Lived in Bangkok until we moved there. He moved away, possibly to stay away from me. <laughs> Don't take it personally. Okay. <laughs> mine, fantastic intellect. And he was the one that told me that story. That, um, And the reason I'm telling you this is that there's an ending that I didn't talk about. He thinks he knows where all the scrolls went once yes. they were confiscated, which really is eye opening. But just the way that we go to a notary public or the way that we go to a dentist or anything, the temple priests that were performing magic would keep registers of what magical spells they would do for people. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of those things were recovered and they were incorrectly translated. So they were just a nonsensical jumble. Yes. But in that book, Techniques of Greco Egyptian Magic, Skinner, uh, with incredible academic fervor, rigor, uh, kind of re not reverse engineered, but just did a better translation of the magical scrolls to see the type of magic that they were using, binding your enemy, blinding your enemy. Uh, Skinner tells an interesting story of how he started doing this one spell for invisibility. And he would go to the mall and practice his invisibility spell. And uh, 
I won't tell you how those stories end. You'll have to read his book. But okay. fascinating. He was so good at not only conceptually unraveling the tangle of what historians tell us about Egyptian magic, but he put it into a, a grimoire, basically, a modern grimoire. Of the English Empire is essentially a progression of Roman power. Mm. Uh, and the families, a lot of the, and some people say dating all the way back to the Egyptian pharaohs, there's this current of power that's hidden power. It's not the puppets on TV, but the hidden mm -hmm. power. All understand this and they all practice it. And that their magic is an active use in wartime and politics. You know about John Dee and Queen Elizabeth. Queen yes. Elizabeth had her own magician and yes. it was an yes. incredibly important part of her, for her, her policy. Yes. That's why she survived when they conquered the Spanish Armada, which was not conquerable really for the English, especially, right, at that stage. And, yeah. and that happened because of magic, really. So, okay, so somebody has this magic, somebody has this possibly Egyptian magic, and they are, and also they're vilifying the serpent as the devil. And this is where my actually, my interest in the goddess principle started for many reasons. But one of them is that all the goddesses are portrayed, you know, with a serpent or with an egg, you know, that is a gift to humanity or, um, uh, you know, using magic as well, right? So, and for example, Eve also, right? The serpent, you know, deceive yeah. Eve. But actually, Eve was a smart cookie because in Gnostic, uh, you know, Gnostic writings, Eve, you know, was actually the important person. You know, she understood the message of a serpent. So, if this Egyptian magic somehow survived through the Roman Empire and the rulers of the empire in which we still li live, let's say. So why don't they want us? Why don't they want us to have it? Have you read The Prince by Machiavelli? Yes, I did read The Prince, yes. All there. People are ungovernable if they're self-empowered. That mm -hmm. um, I believe that that's, and it's right there quite explicitly stated. The Prince is a fictitious work, but it is written ostensibly as this handbook to nobility and wealthy people about how to maintain your power. And you do it by stripping the power base away from your people. You either set them fighting amongst themselves or- And you creating take hierarchy and creating hierarchy. Absolutely. The idea of the hierarchy is one of those Machiavellian ideas. So there's the hierarchy, there's um, artificial money that you have to participate in the system and be a servant to participate in money or you'll starve to death. And the thing that I never understood was why was it so important to take away a person's history in order to subjugate them? Our history has been withheld from us, in particular knowledge of this power that we might tap into, intellectual power and actual magical power. Mm. And so in China, there's uh, pyramids. They're just like the Great Pyramids in Egypt, and they are forbidden. The Chinese government will not allow yes. you to discuss them. You can't address them. If you try and explore them, you will die. If you try and write a, a in Bosnia thesis. too, in Bosnia too, right? So in 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 uh, my part of Europe, or you know, so it's he. There is uh, there are pyramids, and everybody is ridiculing this guy. I think his name is Samir, right? Everybody is ridiculing him that that he's a pseudoscientist and so on because yeah. there are pyramids there. So there is some kind of effort to keep us away from this knowledge. So. Uh, all over the world, right. I have, we have this question about for you because, okay, so we, both of us and, and your wife had a Kundalini experience, right? And that was a very powerful experience. And for me, it rendered me basically, I couldn't function in a normal world, you know? So I, I was dysfunctional in a way. And I, it was very sad, but I almost forced myself down after several months because uh, I had no one to provide for myself, you know? And, and, and I had to function somehow. So how do we deal? How we actually reconcile this amazing experience that we see, you know, we experience this, I don't know what it is, the reality, us, or whatever it is. And then we, still, we are still in this body. So we still have to function in this. And very often, because I was part of the ashram for a while, I saw people who went through initiation, like I did, and had a similar, extremely strong awakening of Kundalini. And they were, you know, kind of in this mad bliss, you know, yes. But they were completely dysfunctional. So people took advantage of them, you know, they couldn't like even know how to buy groceries. So, so how do we reconcile this? Because it's very difficult. The Kundalini can, I don't know if it'll kill you, but it'll sure fry your brain. Mm. And um, 
some people recover and some people don't. I've certainly in this process over the last couple of decades met a lot of people that never recovered from the Kundalini process. And it's very hard to struggle back. And, you know, there's an argument to be made. Why would you want to come back from that? But I was, um, I was wrecked. I did it. I didn't know what was going to happen. I did it in a very un, uh, structured state. I didn't go to an ashram. I wasn't working with a guru. I started doing these things, but I didn't expect anything to happen. I was just curious. What a weird story. I'll just try this. And, okay. and something worked. And it wrecked me. I had an incredibly lucrative job at the television network. My entire life was in service of television. And when I had the Kundalini experience, I couldn't go to work anymore. It phased me out of my career. Outside of a relatively small number of discrete micro-communities in the secular West, the topic of Kundalini almost never comes up. It is not a subject that is taught in schools and not as a significant historical topic. It is not in any way thought of as a necessary inclusion in biology books. It occurs nowhere in the curriculum of the modern Western medical student. It is not a subject that is taken to be centrally important by modern Western medicine. It is not a topic or set of procedures that are utilized or even acknowledged as being legitimate or efficacious by the vast majority of doctors, neurologists, psychologists, psychiatrists, or Western theologians. But for all the silence that Kundalini has been met with in the West, there has, over the past few decades, been an ever-growing presence quietly establishing itself in the zeitgeist of those who have expanded their field of awareness and have begun to explore the perspectives, histories, philosophies, systems of thought, and central values of other non-Western cultures, both contemporary with our own and some which only exist in the distant past. In 24 hours, after my Kundalini experience, I filled up two notebooks, just freehand, writing, writing, writing. And I just sat in this chair and wrote, and I don't know where the information came from or why I knew it. I wrote the Magical Egypt series, not, not just the first three seasons, but four or five seasons that I haven't gotten to yet. And I just sat down and wrote this thing because of this intensity of knowledge of a, something telling me these things. It was what you need to know for the second half of your life. Within two months, I'd retired and uh, got a hold of John West, went to Egypt with no plan. I had one camera, a terrible little prosumer camera, never edited anything. I'd never written a script, but I sat down and I wrote the script to Magical Egypt. And it was just transcribing the things that were told to me in this 24 hour period uh, from Kundalini. I uh, thank you for sharing this because my story is very similar, except that it took a long time because uh, as my one spiritual teacher said, you know, how long is the path as long as your ignorance. So I think my ignorance was wow. long because I was so attached to intellectualism and, and, you know, academic career and wanting to be a literary writer that I thought, what happens to these two things that I always wanted, you know, never mind that, you know, I saw the cosmos and cosmic intelligence, but I would never let it go either. And now... And I'm not sure why, maybe it is the book or maybe I'm just ripe for this, but I feel like I actually finally, after it happened in 2003, integrated this experience. So, wow. so nine, took, uh, 19 years. Yeah, and, uh, and now I, no, I cannot say I understand it, but I integrated it and I finally can let go of the Sphinx. And if I don't let go of the Sphinx, it's just, this is just kind of an automatic pilot. Yes, you, you do need a job, you know, because I, I, I don't have financial resources not to have a job, you know, but it, it, it's not the priority anymore, right? Other things are. So all kinds of anxieties associated with this are largely gone. Although, you know, I'm still human, right? So I still worry about certain things, but it is an incredible experience. So I completely relate to, to what you're saying. And I've heard people who apparently went sometimes to spiritual teachers and told them, take it away. 
because you know it just transformed them so much but i never would have said it you know because that was uh, i had a sense how special it was but you know it was stuff so we have to talk about it because sometimes people romanticize this right. oh, but now oh, also, oh, right. before we go i want you to Show me, you had some visuals that so actually shows the, what, uh, what uh, you know, magical Egypt. Egyptian goats are, right? So that, that's a fantastic work if you could show to our viewers. Yes, I, I would be delighted. I would be happy to. After the original production of Magical Egypt back in the late 90s, a few of us remained f friends and continued our research. And eventually, uh, as we started trading notes and working more specifically on various parts of this research project for uh, studying ancient aesthetics and ancient art. We started comparing notes about uh, some individual things we'd all discovered. And we kind of put them all together and made this fairly important uh, discovery about this missing clue to ancient Egypt that was found in the artwork and in the statuary. And it ended up uh, providing this door that opens up a whole new vista on uh, Egyptian research and uh, really this kind of new way of looking at Egypt and uh, certainly something that demands a reappraisal of the degree of intelligence and scientific sophistication. So it starts like this. Uh, it starts with a bit of a magic trick. Here's the human brain. Here's the brain from underneath. Nothing up my sleeve. I'm going to make a little man appear in the center of your brain. And voila. Some people might be disturbed to know that there is in fact a small entity living rent free in the very center of your brain. This is the uh, brainstem with the diencephalon at the top. The lower, lower area below the belt, as it were, uh, it looks like a pair of fused legs with the medulla, which uh, descends down into the spine. Up at the top, the triangular head is the hypothalamus. So this little entity, this little person that lives inside of us has been the subject of sacred art, sacred esoteric or occult artwork, including divine icons from many ancient cultures. Uh, not surprising because this uh, complex that's referred to generally as the human brainstem includes at the very top of it, the diencephalon uh, which is made up of the holy trinity of uh, pituitary, pineal, and thalamus that uh, is often referred to as the third eye. The other significant structure that's located at this place at the top of the brainstem is the third and fourth ventricles, which themselves play a very important part, a component of human consciousness. So the diencephalon is at the top of the brainstem. There's the two bulbs of the thalamus and uh, the third ventricle, which is involved in uh, cerebro spinal fluid uh, cleaning out brain waste and uh, establishing blood flow. This whole area and the strange shape uh, serves as sort of a nexus between three systems, the nervous system, the circulatory system, and the endocrine system. This significant shape, uh, if it looks familiar, that is because this shape is the pattern upon which one of the most iconic pieces of Egyptian uh, symbolism uh, were based. This is the third ventricle compared to the all-seeing eye of Horus. The lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, and uh, fluid draining down into the fourth ventricle is essential for brain operation. And some would say a, a central aspect of our ability to experience consciousness. So an interesting bit of symbolism that this eye symbolizes knowledge. It symbolizes uh, seeing, just in that word, seeing and cognition are so intimately entwined, uh, the all-seeing eye, knowing, knowing things that are hidden, all aspects hinting at consciousness. And so this is an extremely interesting symbol. And uh, this is one of the first and most recognizable examples of art using biometric shapes as the template. And through that technique, imparting information about the function of these uh, components. So one of the places we started finding biology in the art was something that's been around for quite, it's been around for quite a while. It's been uh, shared infinitely on the internet, on Google, but uh, we had uh, started with this piece of low hanging fruit 
And it was, uh, in some ways, our gateway to the many other more impressive discoveries we would find that showed biology of consciousness in art. But this one's a famous one and a classic one and an extremely eerie uh, correspondence to the human limbic system, which is the diencephalon we were discussing. And uh, the correlate, the artistic, um, the genius artistic incorporation of this important body part into an icon, the all seeing eye. It is even uh, rumored that, uh, well, this is a fairly well known, even among historians and uh, native Egyptian historians, each of the components of this icon, the eyeball, the eye, the uh, uh, eyebrow, these things that don't exist actually in biology, uh, these are all referencing some specific part of the diencephalon that is involved in consciousness and bodily function. And there are legends associated with each part of the eye that indicate the actual function of these brain parts. So the, uh, the third eye, this interesting kind of uh, potential seat of the soul, is the subject of not only Egyptian, but Hindu and Vedic art and fascination for as far back as human history existed, is part of this sort of unacknowledged tradition of Kundalini that uh, is, was also present in ancient Egypt. So here's where we get to some interesting, some interesting sacred art that contains an encrypted schematic or model of some biology that is involved in consciousness. In ancient art, and in particular in the pictures of Egyptian art, the ram statues and the statues of Osiris, there are models that are perfect biometric, accurate models of the brainstem. And they show all the articulations of the brainstem. And what's interesting about it is that your brainstem, when you see it, is a little person. Only the legs are fused wow. together. The these legs are the uh, medulla oblongata, the brain stem. Then the pons is right in the middle, and it's a shape like a torso if you stood like this. So if your legs were joined, you stood like this, and then the head of the statue. If you look at these crowns, the head, the torso, and the legs, you have the medulla oblongata, the pons, the um, mammillary bodies, the, uh, anyway, every, the, the snake on the head, the eyes, every feature, every detail on these statues is an exact match. They show all the articulations of the brainstem. Speaking of crowns, here's another uh, example of a strange ornate ceremonial crown that wasn't actually worn in real life, but turns out to have this amazing significance because it is actually a highly sophisticated and accurate schematic, a, a map or a blueprint of this significant stru brain structure at the center of our brains. And uh, when we see the comparison, there's just, there's no question, uh, involves the uh, crown called the Atev crown. This is the Atev crown. This is Kanum wearing the Atev crown. Here's an example of the Atev crown. And here we go, Kanum wearing the Atev crown. Now, first of all, the the first of many correspondences we'll see in this is the central stock in this crown is the exact shape and uh, size of the, uh, the thalamus here in the brain. This is a human brain from the underside. Um, note the hole that this uh, section of the brain does not include the area where the uh, pineal gland and up here the pituitary. So anyway, so first of all, notice the shape, sort of onion shaped, bowling pin shaped, open at the top. And uh, in this way, it's symbolically depicted as a sheath of wheat tied at the top into a bundle. This uh, reminiscent of the first correlation, this, this illustration shows the first correlation of uh, thalamus. It's based on the Atev crown, which as we'll see is a schematic of the uh, diencephalon, the area, of the, com the complex of the brain known as the third eye, uh, known by, referred to by Rene Descartes as the seat of the soul. Uh, and so the part of the brain that this corresponds to 
when seen from this sagittal view is the thalamus. With the brain completely open, the uh, diencephalon and uh, thalamus and uh, the diencephalon and thalamus extend to the very outside of the brain. And you can see around the, this are the contours of the olfactory nerves that we saw in our little man. There's the torso and there's legs down there and there's his little face. There's the hat and uh, the feathers of the hat here, olfactory nerve. So the first correspondence is that central thalamus. Notice that uh, like the actual thalamus, the hat that is thalamus shaped has a notable uh, point of registration, a, a circle or sphere exactly at the place of the pineal and exactly at the pituitary gland. So here's another view of the diencephalon and the atef crown. And here is a, an example related to the Atef crown that is a, a similar configuration to what we see in the uh, complicated version of the Atef crown. This is a ceremonial uh, bit of ornamental art. And I want to call attention to this, the snakes. See the balls on the head, see this sort of uh, vase looking thing, see the indication there, like a belly button, this horn, and then the uh, sphere on top of the whole structure. So just like the Atev crown, we take this, this uh, ornamental motif and compare it to another cross-section of the brain where the corpus callosum, the ventricles, the pineal gland, the pineal gland, sorry, and the pituitary are um, all indicated. We look at the comparison of this art and we get another amazing correspondence. We will see there, the indication of the pituitary and pineal, which align exactly uh, with the position and location of the pineal and pituitary. So now uh, we've done a tighter uh, analysis of comparison. There's the thalamus, the third ventricle, pineal gland, pituitary, anterior horn of the lateral ventricle, the splenium or the corpus callosum, that strange uh, thing down at the bottom there. So taken all together, this is the diencephalon, uh, the complex referred to as the third eye. It is a very complicated, very distinctive uh, shape and configuration. And here is this same diagram compared to the Atef crown on the left and this particular crown worn by Kanum, one of the Egyptian gods. We will see here that uh, the brain stem and diencephalon at this view is the basis for their design. And not just the overall shape, but detail after detail after detail, we'll see a, a spatial and, and uh, a spatial correspondence. So first of all, the alignment of the pineal gland on all three. The pituitary gland at the top is indicated, uh, extremely important uh, master controller of cognition and brain function. Here's the third ventricle. The third ventricle is the shape that looks like the third eye uh, when we seen from the side. This is from the lower view looking up. And as we see in the third ventricle uh, and the thalamus, there is a negative space where the pineal gland is perfectly in register in all three sizes. And again, we see the significance of this um, sort of bottleneck or binding at the top that uh, where the third ventricle gives birth or gives rise to the lateral ventricle. This is indicated here by the knots in the leaves and the uh, overall shape being compressed at the top with these sort of horns that provide a platform for the pituitary gland. There's the anterior horn of the ladder. So next corpus callosum, a massively uh, important structure in the human brain. And uh, this strange winged shape, the feathered nature of it, um, its, its attitude and disposition uh, is matched in on the uh, left at Hip Crown, this configuration of feathers. And here we have another indication that appears to be feathers. This is very similar to the uh, feather of Mott icon. So another uh, alignment. And then here we have the splenium of the corpus callosum. That is an exact spatial match along all three. Here you have this cool Salvador Dali mustache. 
here a more organized uh, affair and the actual biological component at the base of all of these, see its position relative to the pineal gland, its uh, location on all three of these. Now, uh, if you take then a further comparison of the brain at a different uh, cross-section, this cross-section of the hippocampus, this sort of W shape in the middle here is uh, a complex that includes the hippocampus, the fornix, the amygdala, uh, and um, another essential component of, of brain architecture. So now um, suddenly this image, the Atef motif symbol starts to look interestingly resonant with two snakes facing right or left. The snakes have these balls on top of them. There's the uh, indicator of the pituitary, there again is the pineal gland. Uh, and so uh, here in the Kanum Atef crown, we actually see a risen snake facing one direction, another risen snake facing the other direction. And both snakes have this, uh, this ball on their heads. And so when we look at the, uh, this is the fornix, this is the hippocampus, and there's the amygdala. And when we look at the entire configuration, we see that these snakes suddenly um, make sense and are an indicator of something uh, of a significant component in brain architecture. There's the amygdala responsible for anger and fight or flight response. And so uh, this was a certainly not the only one, but one in a series of increasingly compelling examples that the Egyptians were fascinated with consciousness and somehow anomalously were in possession of a uh, extremely sophisticated science. Egypt was not the only civilization where uh, this information was, was, uh, was known and uh, Egypt was not the only artistic tradition where this technique was employed to draw attention to the divinity that exists as a result of this little divine being in our heads. So first of all, here you have another depiction of the brainstem. And there's a very uh, prominent feature in the brainstem. When you actually remove a brain from a body, you have to cut the trigeminal nerves at the hands here so that uh, they look like these strange little baby hands. Those are very significant in our next series of uh, discoveries. The trigeminal nerve and the, again, the pons and the fused legs are present in uh, in Sumeria and in uh, later Babylonian Mesopotamian cultures, as the Fijian Diana, uh, Artemis, Ishtar, Inanna, all votive statues that use the same grouping, the same mode, uh, see the bound legs, the pawns, which in this case is kind of a strange feature, it's depicted as having multiple breasts, but the outstretched hands are indicated uh, and seem to co and correspond seem to correspond to the position and the attitude of the trigeminal nerves. And then, of course, you have the head. You have this strange headset and this sort of additional architecture where the diencephalon uh, extends into the brain up above. So once again, we have the same tradition. There's the pawns, the fused legs, the hands are in place. This headset and uh, then uh, something that's quite interesting in this case is where the pawns would be, these statues of, uh, of Artemis uh, or Diana uh, related to Ishtar, instead of the pawns, well, at the pawns, they have this nourishing book of uh, this nourishing aggregation of breasts. And once again, you see the uh, tradition of the fused legs that indicate the brainstem and the medulla oblongata. This is interesting because like Egypt, you can use symbolism to indicate the functions and the known functions of each of these parts of the brain. Like this is involved in nourishing or distribution of fluids uh, from a central place in the ponds. Uh, it would make sense symbolically that you would relate these as, um, as uh, multiple breasts. Here's another beautiful example of the same technique, the fused legs and um, indications of a hierarchy of sorts, uh, perhaps indicating the functions of the brainstem in each of these locations. And of course, raising the caduceus, the uh, staff of Hermes, to this ancient uh, tradition of incorporating the secrets of Hermes and Thoth into artwork. 
So uh, this goes back a long ways to Samaria. Uh, and there is one that's uh, almost astounding in the age of it. One of the very first, one of the oldest female votive figures, uh, a divine entity in, in Samaria is uh, Inanna. And as we see here, the same um, in this brainstem, the brainstem, the pons, the trigeminal nerves, there's the face, mammillary bodies, there's the olfactory nerves and the fourth ventricle. We see all of these features in the exact same locations in Mesopotamian Ishtar. They are, this is uh, one of the oldest officially acknowledged recorded uh, bits of statuary. And it assumes this odd posture, in this case, instead of the folded arms, the wings sort of indicate the pawns. The olfactory nerves at the top of the head and the strange shape of the third and fourth ventricle are uh, indicated here in this hat that she's wearing. And uh, you can see in this side-by-side -side comparison, the details of the olfactory nerve and uh, the hypothalamus and nerves are there present. So that's a uh, that's what we call a head scratcher. This knowledge of consciousness and divinity and the association of this strange bit of biology in humanity is a tradition that's been carried and uh, immortalized by artwork throughout the ages, uh, specifically uh, sacred iconic sacred iconic artwork. John West brought attention to Schwaller de Lubix, who was the first one to make inroads into this idea that biological secrets and complex information about biology and about consciousness can be stored or can be conveyed through, uh, through architecture. Uh, in his 15 year study of the Temple of Luxor, he showed that the temple was not only a three dimensional structure, but a four dimensional structure because it grew in time like an organic uh, organism. So each of the stages of Luxor temple corresponded to one of the four stages of growth of the human body. And in a number of other ways, Schwaller demonstrated that this temple was a template for uh, not just the physicality of man, but for the cosmic principles that animated man and uh, culminated in, in human consciousness. So here's some of Schwaller's early, uh, early, early work showing the correlation of the temple to various parts of the body that were areas of significant esoteric anatomy, as he, as he called it. There was other writers from different cultures that have documented the same principle, the same mode of incorporating this sort of hidden template to add meaning to architecture so that a piece of architecture can end up being this significant schematic to one of the central secrets of human consciousness and, and, and of the universe, this strange circuitry that uh, rises up to the third eye in two channels around the central channel of the spine. So using this technique of uh, architectural templates for biology, one of the, uh, uh, another one of the discoveries we made was when we took the front of the Egyptian pylon and aligned it with the brain so that each of the architectural features provided a template or pointed out the important articulations of the brain. In this case, from the uh, front on view or the, the coronal view. In the middle of these big wings here are the uh, ventricles that were so venerated in uh, other artwork. So we have the uh, two hemispheres of the temple that uh, 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 indicate symbolically the two uh, hemispheres of the brain. And just at the corpus callosum, this uh, physical representation uh, in this complex here is the corpus callosum. But symbolically, this door that connects or is bridging architecture for the two mounds of the temple is similar to the corpus callosum bridging the two hemispheres. The door itself, the width of the door shows the olfactory nerves. Here is the uh, pituitary gland, I believe, from this angle. The pineal gland is here, this whole thing is the third ventricle. You can see where the, uh, the corpus callosum and third ventricles um, are here, the extent and the 
fanning out of this bit of architecture perfectly accommodate this and interestingly here uh, we'll see in a minute the winged disc on top of every door is right here and looking at this you can kind of see a biometric perhaps a source of inspiration or a biometric template that explains why the uh, that explains why the winged disc is the way it is so here's where this is in relation to the thalamus I don't know. There it is. So the wing of disc that is at the top of this door bears an uncanny relationship to the lateral ventricles and uh, the corpus callosum here. So another bit of interesting um, biology that is hidden in architecture and in this case, once again, it's not just about biology, but it's biology with a particular emphasis on the diencephalon or this area that we call the third eye. Here, in fact, is Horus with the rising sun, similar to the rising sun in the Japanese or in the uh, Indonesian temple of the two uh, dragons that we looked at before. Uh, another example is, uh, this is one from Masonic literature, and it seems to be hinting at this same method of invisible templating that this temple, which is the template of the brain, here again is the uh, lateral ventricles. This is, by the way, the holy cup, the holy chalice that, uh, from King Arthur legends. Uh, and if you look at all of these significant features in this illustration, including the star that is the winged disc in this position on the door, um, and the other alignments, that there is a certain number of alignments you could say is random, but at a certain point, the architecture is so perfectly lined up and certain odd features seem to align. So this appears to be another example of this occult alignment that artists have been aware of, um, but does not seem to be in, in, the public, in the public eye. So uh, there you go. Uh, Artwork from the past seems to be indicating that there was a uh, anomalous but very sophisticated and very accurate understanding of the critical parts of the brain that are involved in consciousness. There are other indications that they really had quite a bit to say about the actual structure and the dynamics of consciousness, including the famous statues of Horus and Set with the pharaoh in the middle, which is a perfect schematic of the interaction of the uh, right and left hemispheres with the sort of mystical third voice or you know the dispassionate eye sensation of consciousness you are the pharaoh and it is your job to reconcile the uh, eternally paired adversaries Horus and Set one of whom represents spirit and the desire for betterness the uh, aspiration towards spirituality and the other one is uh, as a composite animal represents your animal hungers and your anger and whatnot, and the eternal war between what the body wants and what the mind and the soul want, uh, and the nature of the ongoing quarrel between left and right hemisphere that is just the human condition. So as schematics of human consciousness go, this is another remarkably apt one. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. There are perfect biometric schematics in ancient art, in Vedic art, in Buddhist art, and in ancient Egyptian art. And so um, architectural features, certain icons of hieroglyphs, certain statues, all demonstrate that they had this absolute knowledge of where consciousness arises from. And it's all part of the science that they're conveying that the divinity in you, the God, is consciousness. Your connection to We're the divine here. We're is... And so when art and science were at their highest, they were one and the same. And that advanced cultures would use aesthetics and use art as a carrier of their most centrally important memes and discoveries. So it's important to artists, it's important to um, esotericists that if you go back far enough, art in its truest form carries this ultimate truth. You can say without question that here was an age where the highest ideas and the most accomplished art refused in one. I find that just, it makes me want to cry. It's such a beautiful idea that when art still had nobility, this was the point of art to teach us this thing about ourselves. It's very much like holding up a mirror. Like if you lived in a world with mirrors and you couldn't see yourself, 
this is a schematic representation, first of all, of the biology that allows you to participate in consciousness, and then through symbolic and schematic and allegorical means, a literal map, yeah. a schematic consciousness itself. So would you say that uh, parts of our brain that uh, are represented often as some um, divine figures in Hinduism or especially in Egypt, and also what uh, in Hinduism they call the third eye, that these are actually almost like portals to higher consciousness, to what the mystery of, of everything really? Interesting that you use the word portal. The tagline in Magical Egypt is, there's a door in your head that no one told you about. Oh, wow, wow. I love it. There is a door in your head that no one told you about. It is the door through which we enter into life and pass out of life again. It is the door which separates ordinary consciousness From genius. It is the door that separates time-bound mind from timeless mind. The door that leads from personal consciousness to cosmic consciousness. The mysterious cultures that existed at the very beginning of recorded history, whose cultural and technical accomplishments demonstrate an almost unfathomable genius, took special care to immortalize the instructions that enabled each individual to access their own hidden door. In the Western world, because there's no context for the Kundalini experience, I think people have Kundalini experiences all the time, but there's nothing in our cultural heritage that tells us what. If you go to the doctor and say, I just had a Kundalini experience, that was a one way ticket to the insane asylum. That's um, right. There's nothing that allows us to integrate or to put into context the Kundalini experience in the West. So if you're Gopi Krishna and you have a Kundalini experience, it is your culture. It's the fabric of your culture that explains to you what the Kundalini process is. But in the West, we have none of that. It's ridiculed and you're literally considered insane if you talk to the wrong people, which are doctors and psychiatrists. If you talk to them about a Kundalini experience, they will give you a lobotomy or put you in a, you know, they'll try and fix you. <laughs> but, right. Right, um, you know, um, there's a metaphor of people hiking in a cave and they run across villagers who've never seen the light of day. And one of the explorers gets sick and he goes to the doctor and the doctor said, oh, I see the problem. You got these two round things. I removed those because uh, they didn't have eyes. Well, here's your problem. You got those eyes. Those aren't supposed to be there. So I'm going to remove them. If you go to Western doctors with a Kundalini related problem, it's not going to be good. Keep it to yourself. That's why there's such a strange question about do you even talk to anyone once you've had a Kundalini experience? Yeah. And the reason I decided to is I think people are having these incredibly meaningful, incredibly mystical experiences, but they're either told they're insane, they're told it didn't happen. The Kundalini event is often referred to as an awakening. This awakening can be triggered by tantric practices, but can also happen from significant life events, use of recreational drugs, or even spontaneously for no apparent reason. There are many reported cases of spontaneous kundalini events which caught the experiencer totally by surprise. For the most part in the West, there is no cultural framework to place something like this into context and the experiences are left without any way to process or constructively react to it. When it arises spontaneously and unexpectedly, it can be a traumatic, fearful, and confusing experience. This can also lead to kundalini psychosis, and most Western doctors will consider a person reporting experiences like this to be a candidate for a mental institution. 
I thought the most useful thing I could do was maybe sacrifice some of my own privacy and some of my own dignity to talk about this thing that you might not be. Mm. A lot of really smart people say you should never talk about this. But I also kind of think that that might be part of the suppression of the Kundalini experience. So that was the point. You're doing a wonderful bit of work and I've certainly devoted myself to um, possibly normalizing this experience. If you understand that a Kundalini process might be akin to going through puberty, or I've, I've often talked to it about it as a meta puberty or a meta orgasm, a soul mm -hmm. orgasm, or a body yeah. orgasm. A like orgasm. soul orgasm, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if you've had it, you know what I'm talking about. And it doesn't necessarily need to happen in a sexual experience, but it is intensely sexual when it happens. But it's not, so it's like a higher body orgasm, brain yeah. orgasm or something. And so, you know, if you lived in Edwardian, Victorian England, back when sex was banned, yeah. you might have the sexual experience and not understand what it was, even then nobody will talk to you about it. And everyone says, well, it's because you're a sinner. It's because you're full of sin. <laughs> Don't do that anymore. And we're going to cut your hands off or something. And so I cannot applaud you enough for bringing sensible, rational, scientific conversation to this thing that shouldn't be weird. It shouldn't be paranormal it is like an orgasm it's like going through puberty only it's a metaphysical thing and i don't pretend to understand what it is but i've certainly since i've had it i've spent the rest of my life trying to figure out what it is and um, now i feel like i'm repeating myself but talking about this with other people so that other people who've had this experience can go oh my god that's what happened to me and i never had a way to put it into words that is the most important thing of all oh and one more thing I'm being annoying now i'm sure nebuchadnezzar king nebuchadnezzar in the bible Mm -hmm. I have a prophecy from one of his advisors. A son is going to be born this year who will usurp your throne. So you know what Nebuchadnezzar did? He killed all the firstborn sons. Yes. Imagine, you know how history keeps some, they say it doesn't repeat, but it echoes. It recapitulates. If it was commonly known among the ruling class that something possibly configuration of the stars or just this new knowledge that you are right now playing a part in rolling out and shining a light on or removing it from its obscurity, if this knowledge became public knowledge, humanity is going to go through this collective evolution that makes us ungovernable, makes us too smart to bully, it makes us no longer. Hey. <laughs> you are playing a part in that. Um, when the human body goes through puberty, the tiniest, tiniest little thing happens in your brain and starts secreting this chemical that are people like you and I. And, mm -hmm. and that tiny little thing creates this system wide shift of puberty, and your body is never the same. Mm -hmm. um, societally you and i are in the process of trying to initiate a societal puberty where we graduate to our adulthood where it's no longer appropriate for a mother to watch over us and not let us out of the house or mm. you know us with covid or so um uh fluoride uh i think electromagnetic waves rf frequencies wi-fi 5g all of those things are incredibly effective kundalini suppressors Mm. Uh, fluoride in particular, uh, there was a chemical in NutraSweet that calcified your pineal wow. gland. Those industrial products that are fed to us, almost demanded of us, um, drinking tea and coffee, isn't it weird that that's so ingrained in our body? That calcifies your pineal gland and makes a, a kundalini process impossible. It's a little dark if this just gets thrown on you all at once, but our entire society is built to keep you from having a kundalini experience. And the work that you're doing right now and the research that you're going through and your attempt to present this to the public in a non-crazy, non, this is a scientific subject. And it's just as scientific as studying the mysteries of puberty. It's just as necessary because, you know, we're in a death spiral. The West right now is in a death spiral. I feel like the only hope that humanity has is for us all to recognize that an incredibly important thing about ourselves, perhaps the most important thing about ourselves is being actively kept from us and why is that? I want to know. And anytime I'm forbidden to do something, I rush out and do it just to see, why is this forbidden? Why do people not want me to do this? I'm going to go do it. You know what I mean? Fantastic. So thank you for doing the, the magical Egypt because this is what it does and it brings it more and more to human consciousness, especially because you frame it with an ancient Egypt, which is such a field of fascination geographically, magically, in every possible way. So people relate it maybe easier to this than, you know, uh, esoteric Hindu Hinduism or something. And it is more based in the West, you know, within what is called the Western culture. So thank you so much for doing this. 
Um, and absolutely, my pleasure, Joanne, and I applaud you for the, the work you're doing. So we really have to open up to ourselves uh, to this. So thank you for your wonderful work. And I'll leave a link uh, to your show, to your series, actually. And I'm so glad to hear that there will be more because I thought there were only three parts, but you say there will be part four and five or? It depends on how long I live. I will probably, if I live to be 200, I would never exhaust the ideas. <laughs> it's wonderful. I hope you have a long life. Thank you so much, Chance.